Uh, first, it will be Dr. Jyoti, who will be discussing her COVID-19 home treatment protocol for India. Uh, next, I will be talking about some inflammatory pathways in COVID-19 and how we can block those. And our holistic nutritionist Seema will also be talking about nutrition in COVID-19 and how to reduce inflammation. So it should be a very nice, um, exciting and interactive day. We are live on YouTube and Facebook. So I would like to introduce, um, encourage anyone who'd like to talk to us or interact with us to feel free to message and we will uh, keep a lookout for those and try to respond to that. So let's start off with a brief introduction with uh, Dr. Jyoti and Seema and then we can start with our talks. Santosh Hello everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Dr. Jyoti Rawat. I'm a family physician in Toronto. Uh, I've been trained in UK as a family doctor and now working in uh, Toronto. Uh, my today's topic, I'm, I'm just going to present a brief talk on managing COVID-19, uh, especially in Indian setup. So yeah, I look forward to um, doing my, my talk and listening to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. Thank you, Dr. Sapa, and God bless you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Seema Nair. I'm a registered holistic nutritionist. And uh, today's topic, we will be discussing more on anti-inflammatory diet and what are the things that we can do uh, naturally uh, to basically prevent or I, I don't know, after taking vaccinations, also I've seen people getting COVID and also what, what can we do uh, regarding that. So I'm looking forward for the, this talk. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Thank you, Seema. I think Sapan has gone for a break. So in the meantime, I can talk. <laughs> I love talking. Uh, hi, my name Hi. is Nadma Bablani. Namaste, auntie. Namaste, uncle. How I hope Namaste. everything is going on your side. I'm a teacher and I have my nutrition background. I might add something in the blog depending on, depending on how the topic is going. I just got over with COVID. My, um, as a patient, I can talk right now. Um, the, it just happened that I was under the supervision of Dr. Sapan and he was talking about, he was taking care of me and treating me too. Uh, dip, uh, he did advise me on a lot of uh, multivitamins and uh, and uh, all the supplements that I can take to boost my immunity. Sorry, Sapan, I just took over because we didn't see you there. So uh, he did treat me and I'm, I'm feeling much better. Uh, it just started with my stomach upset. Then it started with little fever, headache, chills. Uh, body ache and uh, so on. It was really, really difficult. It felt like a really bad flu. Like we do get flus in uh, Toronto, India. Uh, India also we get viral infections, but it felt like more than that. So my advice to all the people who are taking it it's just very lightly that it's, it's just a viral or flu infection. It will pass through your body. It will do more than that. Like I really felt for last 20 days i had no energy i could not even come down from my bedroom downstairs going up and down it was like a great effort on my lungs i could not breathe properly at certain time i had to be on um, um puffer that uh, helped me later after a week so i'm sure sapan will talk about that so as a patient if anyone wants to know more about it definitely i'm a good case here so sapan i'll pass it to you i'm sorry to jump in Thank you. God bless. 
thank, thank you. Thank you for all those introductions. So uh, let's get ahead with the talk. So Jyoti, um, if you would present your screen and let's, let's start with the first talk of the day. Thank you, Sadhna. Thank you, Sapan. So I have just made a small like a slideshow uh, to share with you. Um, purpose of the um, talk is how we can manage cases of COVID-19 uh, at home. It's a, this is mainly catered for India because I think India is facing a different challenge compared to anywhere else in the world. Uh, reason being number of cases have risen too high. So the medical care is um, limited now and it's overstretched, um, almost an overwhelming situation. So I think we, I felt as a physician, I have to share my part and what we can do at home, the very best we can do at home by, you know, the care that can be offered by a family physician or an internal medical, medical doctor, whoever is attending the patient. So I feel this protocol was relevant and, and important. So, um, I have tried, I've tried to keep some bullet points there just to keep it very simple and specific. Uh, it's all evidence-based. Ha I'm happy to share the evidence in the end that why we reached to the conclusion and why we're giving all that treatment. So I'll do my presentation. Um, so let me share my screen, please. Um, Okay. So I hope you can see the screen, right? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll make this a full screen. And um, we can go from here, the first slide. Okay. So this is really talking about home management. We are not talking about hospital management. We are not talking about those very sick people who need hospital. Uh, the main reason why somebody needs hospital is if their oxygen saturation is low. Somebody who is having low oxygen saturation, that means oxygen below 94 on air, needs to be in hospital. So this is, again, to reinforce, this is mainly for Indian setup. Now, most important is planning. Planning means you know that you have symptoms of COVID-19 or you have been in contact with somebody who had um, infection. There's a very high likelihood if you're a close contact, you are going to get infection because it is a very highly contagious condition. So in that case, you have to equip yourself with following so by a pulse oximeter, they are easily available nowadays. It's a small equipment that you put on your finger and it reads your oxygen level. Uh, second thing is a thermometer, a digital thermometer that you can use to check your temperature. A blood pressure monitor, I would recommend because it's again an important part of monitoring. So blood pressure monitor checks your blood pressure, but it also gives you a pulse rate. Oxygen and pulse rate, these are two really, really important things, very important. When you don't have any equipment, when you don't have any blood tests, no X-ray CT, they tell us a lot. So a doctor understands your health by those two numbers. Now, this is a talk mainly catered for a doctor or a physician. So I would say when you're starting to manage a patient or starting a treatment, stopping a treatment, please take care of their pre-existing uh, condition. So whether they have any health issues right now or what medication they take, because you might you don't want to give them the same pill again. They might be on something already. And you also want to manage the interaction because interaction means sometimes when you give one medication, the other medication will interfere with that drug and cause side effects or sometimes serious side effects. So that's very important. Uh, we have noticed that, uh, you know, sometimes maybe because of resources or um, a bit of a, uh, you know, misunderstanding, the, the medications can be a problem. Uh, they can cause issues like kidney problem, liver problem, if they're not prescribed correctly. Um, so that's important. Now, this is the initial phase of illness. 
at more and more people now understand that the first phase of illness is viremic phase viremic means then there is a virus active within i would say first five days seven days your virus is doing everything it is just triggering off every all the receptors and going in your airway slowly going into your lungs um, creating all the confusion and at that stage um, we treat things differently at this moment you're only dealing mostly with the virus your immunity etc so the following treatment in this list are useful most of these things you can get without prescription for some uh, you will need prescription so um, you need prescription for ivermectin bromhexine budesonide inhaler however you don't need inhaler for certain other things so vitamin d high dose we know now that vitamin d is considered to be a really important um, factor uh, for increasing your immunity. So high dose vitamin D, which is 2000 international unit, twice daily for 10 days. This you can get over online pharmacy. You can get a friend to deliver to you. Same with vitamin C. Vitamin C comes from fruits, oranges, citrus fruits, uh, etc., vegetable fruits. So, but at this point you need a high dose. So we're talking about 1000 milligram twice daily, a high dose of vitamin C for 10 days. Zinc. Zinc has kind of an antiviral property and it kind of uh, changes how virus enters inside your cell and what it does inside your cell. So zinc is really important. Um, people say when you take zinc, it doesn't go directly into your cell. But if you take some a medication called quercetin, quercetin is a natural product which comes from a lot of the vegetables, fruits like onion and all. You can get the quercetin pills. So if you can get zinc with quercetin, it's better. If you cannot, then you can start just zinc 50 milligram twice daily on its own. Ivermectin. Ivermectin is a very interesting drug. It's actually an antiparasitic drug. However, there have been more and more evidence that it has antiviral properties. So initially, they did some studies outside the human body, what we call as in vitro study. That means they analyze what does Ivermectin do. And ivermectin actually reduced the amount, number of bacteria, the multiplication pace of bacteria, so it can reduce the viremia. Um, doesn't mean it's a treatment. It's just to control that viremic phase. So take vi vi ivermectin, 12 milligram once daily. There have been lots of studies for ivermectin in different parts of the world. In India, it's been approved. It's not approved in Canada for early treatment as yet, but I think we are talking about the Indian scenario here. Bromohexine is a drug um, which is used for cough. It's an eight milligram tablet. You can take that three times a day. So if you're coughing a lot, uh, take bromohexine eight milligram. It will break some of the mucus in your lungs. Also, it works on the receptor level um, to improve the outcome. Um, I will talk about butosonide first because butosonide is um, here, uh, two, two numbers down. So again, butosonide is inhaler. It's a steroid inhaler. Um, again, extremely good evidence. Uh, recently, there's a study in UK. I think it was published in Lancet too. Lancet is a very um, reliable source of information that if you give steroid inhaler or nebulizer, it can improve the outcome. So butyrsonide, you can easily get as an inhaler from on your doctor's prescription um, and use that. If if you really want to have nebulizer, so some people feel more comfortable using the nebulizer. Nebulizer is like an equipment which uh, where you use and it creates a mist. Uh, you use a mask, the mist goes into your mouth and into your lungs then uh, through your nose and mouth and it reduces the inflammation in the lung. So I would like to emphasize that COVID-19 is not just a viral infection. As Sadna said, she felt short of breath, she felt unwell, lots of other things are happening here, not just because you have virus, it's also because you have an inflammation going on. So please be aware, inflammation needs to be taken care of. Now acetylcysteine is another drug which again is used for cough, uh, again it breaks the mucus, if you feel you're very chesty, not necessarily chesty but significant dry cough, chest congestion, not able to feel comfortable at this point of time, then use acetylcysteine as well. Paracetamol is for fever. 
paracetamol one gram tablet that you can take maximum four times a day. In India, it comes with the name Do Dolo, I think, Dolo, which is, I think, 650 milligram. It's okay, you can take 650 milligram uh, four times a day, and that's totally acceptable. Now, at this stage, I would like to emphasize Usually in early phase, people do not get shortness of breath or bad illness. However, you're not same. Everybody is different. If our immune response is kicking in too fast and producing the thromboinflammatory changes early, then we have to intervene. So in the early phase, if your oxygen levels are going below 94, we need to contact the doctor and hopefully doctor will uh, assess you first of all and then arrange for hospital care. Why this is important is the antiviral drugs. I know you, if you go to social media, there are a lot of people who are looking for antiviral medication like remdesivir. Um, remdesivir is an expensive treatment, not easily available, and it can be administered in hospital setting mostly. Now, if somebody is really ill or unwell in the first seven days of illness with oxygen saturation going down below 94%, then um, they could be hospitalized and given remdesivir because they're in their early illness. The role of steroid in early illness, um, I'm going to talk about that later, but be cautious with that. Unless somebody has low oxygen, we should try to avoid steroid because steroids are excellent drug, especially in managing COVID-19. But if you administer those in an early phase of illness, uh, they can cause um, uh, poor, poor immunity. And that could increase the risk of fungal infection, bacterial infection. So steroid use with caution only if the oxygen saturation is going down. Preferably at this point, patients should be connected with hospital. So they could be given antiviral medication like uh, remdesivir along with steroid, with or without steroid, then hospital will decide that. So, but this early treatment is something we can do at home proactively, try to reduce the inflammation in our body. Now, this is the important part. And a lot of confusion and questions come here that the previous medication we talked about was mostly for a low risk group. Low risk group means healthy people, well people, those who are doing well, etc. cetera. Um, there is a group of patients who are high risk. So patient means high risk group includes patient over the age of 60, those who have diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease means pre-existing heart disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease, CVD means previous stroke, uh, kidney disease, liver disease, respiratory condition like asthma, chronic lung disease. Some people have immunosuppressive condition. That means their immunity is poor um, due to lupus. Uh, I don't know, certain medication can reduce your immunity, HIV, etc. They are high risk. Obesity, now obesity is a high risk condition. So somebody who is uh, excessively overweight, uh, they are considered high risk as well as sleep apnea. I think what happens in these groups, there is already some pre-existing inflammation in the body, right? Because over a period of time, the body has been dealing with all these problems. So there is a pre-existing inflammation. And if we, um, get uh, another infection on top, uh, their reaction is worse than somebody who's healthy and well. However, in India, we have seen that because the virus has changed, um, virus is strong, it's attacking younger people as well. So it's affecting young people, even their 40s and all. Um, so high risk is a group is important, as well as the monitoring to make sure the low risk group are not actually getting worse. So please remember that. Now there are three extra medication which uh, we like to recommend for the high risk group. So all the treatment that we're giving for low risk people like vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, um, and uh, bromhexine and all that. Along with that, so on top of that, 
we add certain medication like colchicine 0.5 milligram once a day for five days now colchicine is an anti-inflammatory that we use for um, health conditions like uh, gout also used for pericarditis which is a you know kind of inflammation of the outer cover of the heart um, it's used now for acute coronary syndrome which again is uh, related to heart so it, there's a growing evidence that this drug is anti-inflammatory and it has some evidence so high risk group your physician can consider colchicine uh, this will buy us some time as well. So we don't want to give people steroid immediately. We want to avoid it. So colchicine will give us some time that we are not suppressing your immunity, but we are taking care of the inflammation in your body by giving you this medication. And hopefully a few days later, if you need steroid, we can do that. So that's the idea. Aspirin, we all know, everybody knows what aspirin is. And some of us already take aspirin at low dose for some reason or other. So uh, with colchicine, please be careful. Side effects are, are bowel side effect like diarrhea, stomach upset, rash, severe reaction. Colchicine should only be used if you think it's safe. Uh, if your kidney function is normal, liver function is normal. And it also doesn't go well with statin. Statin means the cholesterol medication, which a lot of people take and some antibiotics. So your family doctor or your medical medicine uh, internist, whoever, will look into that. Coming back to aspirin. Aspirin needs to be taken carefully because it can cause stomach irritation, gastritis, or even stomach ulcer. So high dose of aspirin has a very good evidence, a strong evidence that it reduces the early... Now this is inflammation at different level. Um, in COVID-19 patients, there have been a lot of blood clot formation, even small blood clots in the small capillaries or small blood vessels. Um, aspirin is an antiplatelet drug and also an anti-inflammatory uh, in some ways. So it works on that uh, blood capillary level to prevent the aggregation of uh, platelet, which causes the blood clot formation uh, or even small clot formation. Um, and it also causes, it reduces the inflammation of those capillaries, what we call endothelitis. So some people ask me why aspirin. Aspirin doesn't have a lot of role, but it has a role in early phases because the, before we reach the blood clot formation stage, there are some little subtle changes that are going on here, and aspirin will take care of those. Again, with your doctor's advice, if you already take aspirin, your doctor needs to adjust the dose. Now, highlighting again that people, uh, the COVID-19 is a thromboinflammation condition. So when we see that people who are very unwell and or even some countries and they do autopsy or the postmortem, they find that there was a lot of blood clot formation in the small capillaries, larger vessel. It can even trigger off stroke or heart attack. And a lot of people die because of those severe complications. So the river oxaban is a blood thinning agent. If somebody cannot take aspirin, river oxaban can be considered by your doctor in that situation. If you have a previous history of blood clot, uh, significant risk factor, then rivaroxaban or a blood thinning agent is very important. Femotidine is a pill that we use for stomach protection. So somebody who's taking strong medication, it protects the stomach against any anti, uh, any inflammation, sorry, the stomach irritation or ulcer formation. So femotidine is important. A uh, lot of people take pantoprazole already so in canada pantoprazole 40 milligram is uh, covered on ohip so many patients take that in india also people take pantoprazole in that case you will stop pantoprazole or lansoprazole or rabiprazole things like those and give famotidine because famotidine has a better evidence so that's important please remember if your patient is having oxygen saturation below 94 percent in early phase of illness or in later part, they should be considered for hospital. If they are within uh, first 10 days of illness, then they can receive remdesivir. Uh, if they are within first seven days of illness, they can get plasma therapy. The challenge here is, if I talk about um, situation in India, is finding the beds. 
So therefore, there is a lot of onus on the physicians or doctors treating patients at home. So moving on to next group, this is the most important part, um, most important um, aspect of illness. Most complications happen because of blood clot formation and too much inflammation in our body. This can happen to high risk, low risk, young people, old people. Therefore, the monitoring is important. First and foremost, we can do monitoring at home by doing blood pressure, pulse, oxygen, temperature. If somebody has high pulse rate, if you see there is a consistent high pulse rate, there is something going on here which is not right. So pulse above 100 is considered to be fast. Also, if a patient is having persistent high temperature, that means he's not settling down, his body is not settling down, like it would happen to a lot of people. Um, having a high temperature, fast heartbeat, low oxygen, first part of monitoring, and you let your doctor know about it. Monitor yourself a few times, three times a day at least, maybe more. Another aspect of monitoring is doing the blood test. Now, should we do blood tests for everybody? It's up to you. If you can afford it, if you can have somebody come to your house. Uh, when my parents had COVID-19, uh, we could manage a lab a technician to come to a house, a lab worker come to a house and do the blood test. It was easy enough. If you have access to the blood test, please do on day seven. Day seven is the time when you're going into a transition phase. That means you're moving from mild illness or viremic phase to a moderate to severe illness or into inflammation phase. So get the blood test done. All these blood tests that I mentioned here, which include CRP, D-dimer, uh, blood count, liver function. Um, it, this tells us a lot about what path this patient is going to take. Some people argue day seven is too early. It may be too early because inflammation sometimes start on day eight, nine, 10, but we don't know. I think my idea of day seven came from the fact that if there is an early inflammation, let's take our targeted now, then leaving it till day 10. But if everything is okay, or even if it's abnormal, you repeat the blood test on day 10, decide your treatment based on the blood test. Um, so you take all the medication as we talked about in the first week. CRP um, is C-reactive protein. Uh, we know a lot about this now that it plays a very important role. It's an inflammatory marker. So if a doctor notices that your CRP is very high, the normal level is six, if it's above six, you know, there will be some increase in CRP. So five to 10 is all good. If you notice going 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and I've seen even in hundreds, that is danger zone because we know the inflammation is going on and on and on. We're not able to stop it at this point of time. So we have to be smart. Day eight, nine, 10, 11. They are days when you have to be smart and beat the virus and reduce the inflammation by whichever means you can. So uh, I think the virus is smart, but we have to be a little bit more smart. And therefore, I talk a lot about monitoring. Um, if your CRP is high and patient is not looking well, feeling well, you could consider early steroid therapy uh, and thromboprophylaxis. Because when there is inflammation going on, there is also a risk of thrombosis going on or in the background, the clots are forming. So you want to give steroid and the thromboprophylaxis therapy, which means rivaroxaban. Steroid, you can use prednisolone, and I'm going to talk to you about it. If you suspect there is a bacterial infection. Now, this is interesting because in India, anybody who goes to hospital gets given azithromycin, um, meropenem, very strong antibiotic, and clarithromycin, um, very, very strong treatment. We have to be careful that antibiotics are not healthy if they are given for no reason. They can cause problems. So they can cause fungal infection. Actually, fungal infection is going up um, in India. If you, if you if you speak to the doctors, we have some doctor colleagues uh, from medical school, and they say the fungal infections are rising uh, dramatically because of long use of steroid and antibiotics. So use them carefully. If you think your patient has a bacterial infection, if it's a straightforward a bacterial infection, you give doxycycline 200 milligram twice daily. 
if you think a patient has a dangerous type of blood pressure or different complicated one, you treat it. But mind you, this is a viral condition. We are treating the viral condition. This is not a bacterial infection. So giving somebody an antibiotic on the first two days of illness, three days of illness for no reason is not right. Um, another important blood test, so important, is D-dimer. Now, D-dimer, what happens is when there is a clot formation, there are some products that are produced, and the degeneration of the products leads to another chemical, you know, a breakdown of it causes D-dimer. D-dimer tells us if there could be a possible a blood clot formation going on in your body, or if that pathway is being triggered off. D-dimer uh, is very sensitive test, but it is not specific. So if your D-dimer is high, um, it means you can have a blood clot, but it may also be high because of inflammation. So uh, I think D-dimer is important, but we shouldn't get too alarmed by this, but of course monitoring is important. If patient has a high D-dimer, but no signs of blood clot formation, like uh, DVT, deep vein thrombosis, or pulmonary embolism, which is a bigger form of blood clot, uh, then you can keep patients on rivaroxaban, which is a blood thinning agent at a lower dose. Uh, if there is a very high blood D-dimer with some symptoms, well, D-dimer with symptoms, I will say, uh, of blood clot formation, like uh, leg swelling, chest pain, difficulty in breathing, oxygen going down, then you put patient on rivaroxaban, but moreover, you could consider this patient for uh, hospital admission. So if you suspect a blood clot, uh, you see there is noticeable signs there that this is blood clot formation established or going to happen, you send them to hospital for heparin. However, if you think this is possibly just an inflammation D-dimer as a proactive approach, as a profile access, you can start patient on, you must start patient on rivaroxaban if you feel comfortable. Obviously, a skill of doctor and also their confidence level is 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 important. That how comfortable they feel doing all this, um, and then, then based on that you can do that. But you can always take an opinion from hospital doctor or a virtual consultation. In India, we have a lot of virtual consultation forums now, so cardiologists or work doctors in hospital can guide you. Hypoxia. Now, if you look at the All India Institute Medical Science Guideline. They demarcate um, uh, illness as mild, moderate, and severe um, based on the oxygen. If somebody has normal oxygen, they're mild. If the oxygen is below 94 plus few other things, they are uh, moderate. If they are severe, then oxygen will be further lower. We are talking about below uh, 91. So look at the AIMS guideline. I think every doctor should look at it and follow it because it is very good. It's very clear uh, evidence base. So if somebody has low oxygen, below 94%, that person should be hospitalized. We are dealing with difficult situation in India because there are no hospital beds. Uh, even when my parents were sick at one point, my dad's oxygen went up to 93, 92 as well. And then there was this panic situation uh, trying to find the beds. But unfortunately, we could not find the beds despite of me, you know, you know I had some... Um, kind of contacts with some doctors there or some friends who were trying to help me, but there were no hospital beds. Now, that's where the role comes in. Um, you have to be smart. Uh, don't let the virus be more smart than you. Uh, that means you could consider steroid. First, try for hospital. If you think there is no hope, start the patient on oral steroid therapy. Um, prednisolone is commonly used. The dose is 0.5 to 1 milligram uh, per kilogram. Start with 0.5 milligram. So person who is about 70 to 80 kilogram will get 40 milligram of prednisolone for five to seven days. Um, increase the dose. If you think the patient's still out of breath, CRP is increasing and they're not looking good. You can also use dexamethasone, which is another drug. Uh, the dexamethasone was used in the trials uh, in UK um, and uh, they found that steroid have a big role to play in reducing the mortality it's probably actually one of the only few drugs who, which reduce the mortality, that means death uh, uh, numbers. Budesonide is a, a, a buffer or it's a nebulizer. You put it on your ma face and it's a mask uh, you, that gives you uh, steroid in the lungs. So hypoxia is important. If that's the case, you need to be very quick, uh, either hospitalize it or intervene. 
uh, special notes. <laughs> I think this is quite an important part of uh, the talk. Because we want to do good uh, by treating the patient. We want to give them the benefit, but not the harm of treatment, because treatments can be harmful. So steroid use in early days, like five to seven days of illness, if it's not required, it can cause infection, it can cause fungal infection, bacterial infection, reduce the immunity and unnecessary treatment. If the patient is not well in the first seven days, they should be considered like low oxygen. When I say not well, I mean low oxygen um, or risk or showing features of blood clot, they should be taken to hospital. Colchicine is an anti-inflammatory. It plays a significant role. If you feel confident, use it. And if there is no problem with the interaction and side effect, you can use that early. Now, some medications that are used in India, like theophyllin, theophyllin opens up the air. It's a bronchodilator, strong antibiotic like macro, macrolide antibiotic, hydroxychloroquine. These drugs can cause irregular heartbeat or abnormal heart rhythm, which can even cause sudden death. So please be careful. If you're using medication like theophyllin, hydroxychloroquine, macrolide, these medications have to be taken very carefully. If you use the drugs and cause harm to patient, it's not right. So please be careful. Do not hospitalize for minor illness. I know in India, if you're affluent, if you are a very important person, what you call is a VIP, you want to get a bed. Please don't get a bed. Leave the bed for people who are not well, because there are a lot of people who need treatment at this point of time. Uh, leave the beds for them. You let your family physician uh, treat you at home. If you are unwell, that's when you look for bed. Um, it's, it's quite important, I think. Now, steroid use in hypoxia, if somebody has low oxygen, below 94%, feel comfortable using steroid. If you cannot get a hospital bed after day seven of illness, if it's before day seven of illness, you try to get patient into hospital for remdesivir, Remdesivir is difficult to get hold of. Um, uh, so if you think you cannot uh, achieve that, then you have to manage patient at home. Uh, of course, uh, being, on, being on the safer side. Um, so that's important. Now consult your local doctor because despite all this guidance, I think the first page of treatment where we are talking about mild illness, taking vitamin D, zinc, um, you know, um, bromo, bromohexine and all, you can probably do that yourself. So mild illness, as soon as you have symptoms of mild illness, start the first page of treatment that I had discussed with you, which is vitamin D, vitamin C, and so on, uh, zinc. But, you know, you need a doctor. And even if it's on a telephone or on a, you know, on a video chat, you want a doctor to tell you this medicine is safe, this is not safe, you can take this and you cannot take this. So please do that. Share the AIMS guideline with your doctor because AIMS guidelines are amazing. They are very good. I'll show you the, actually the AIMS guidelines. Uh, I think I have that here. Yeah. So if you look at AIMS guideline, uh, it shows mild illness, moderate, and severe illness. Mild illness means you have mild symptoms. Moderate illness means your oxygen is below 90 to 93. So it's below 93, you can say. Um, and uh, between 90 to 93, uh, your pulse, so your breathing, faster you know if you're breathing fast that means your body is working hard right so we have to be careful severe disease when your oxygen is below 90 and your breathing rate is above 30. this is ic situation this is the ward situation and that's the home situation i think when you go into moderate disease if you are not able to find your hospital bed because it's very difficult to find a hospital bed in india in the current situation you can do things at home in the meantime. If your doctor thinks you are com he's comfortable, they can give you steroid sec second week onwards. They can give you treatment to prevent blood clot formation. And those two things are life-saving. Steroid after day seven, blood thinning agent if there is a risk of blood clot formation or you're high risk. If you do those two things, you're kind of doing the right thing. You're on the safe track. However, things can change. So uh, please be careful to monitor carefully. Now, people sometimes ask me, 
uh, about colchicine. Why do we co give colchicine? Because not many doctors give colchicine. Now, if you look at this colchicine, there is evidence. Uh, this is a trial where called Corona trial. I think this was done in Canada in Montreal, where they said if you give colchicine, you can get some good results, reduction in the hospitalization, reduction in the death uh, as well. Uh, if it's safe to give colchicine, please consider that. Uh, aspirin. Aspirin is well known. It can be considered very early on uh, in the early illness or if it's a mild uh, situation, uh, it prevents the blood clot for uh, you know, not the blood clot formation, but it prevents the early changes that happen at the cell level or blood cell blood capillary level by reducing the clotting. Uh, so platelet cells come together when they come together, they damage the lining of the uh, endothelium, which is the lining of the blood vessel and prevents somewhat reduces that process of uh, clotting. So consider that famotidine, again, there is some evidence. So it is all based on the studies around the world. So that's all I have to say. Um, Dr. Mr. Rawat knows a lot more than I do. A lot of protocols he's written and I actually follow a lot of the protocols he has made. And I just, uh, I just made a, you know, uh, I follow his guidance basically and, and, and the blogs. So I'll close this and I'll try to join back the meeting. Uh, see how Thank I you so much, Dr. Jyoti. God oh, bless you. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you Jyoti. So, Thanks, Sapani. Thank you, Dr. Sapani. I know that everyone's actually waiting for Seema's talk. That's the one everyone's talking, everyone's waiting for. But uh, me and Jyoti will try to be quick in um, getting through the medical scientific parts. Uh, I'm really happy to see that so many people have joined us. Uh, it's really exciting. And uh, do we have any questions for Jyoti on this part? Uh, and shall I move on to my part, or shall I just shall I just move on? Okay. So Jyoti, that was great, fantastic. Thank you so much. And let me now Thank you. go ahead and share my screen. I will try to be quick because um, I know all of you are getting a bit fatigued with um, so much medical talk. And then we can get on to the real, the, the talk that you're really interested in, which is uh, Seema's talk about nutrition during COVID-19. So let's, uh, let's get on with my talk first. Great, so there is a really important uh, aspect here that we're trying to understand. And uh, what I will attempt to do today is explain COVID-19 inflammatory pathways and what we're trying to achieve. Inflammation is the name of the game when it comes to COVID-19. You have to reduce inflammation. It is that inflammation which causes blood clotting Often we say COVID-19, the virus only stays in your body for seven to 10 days. It is the result of inflammation and thromboinflammation, which proves dangerous for patients. The most effective treatment for COVID-19 so far is steroids. However, there is a problem. If you use steroids too soon, then the problem arises that steroids can not only reduce inflammation, but they can also reduce your immunity. They can reduce, they can be immune suppressant. Not, not only can that reduce antibody production, but also it can potentially also uh, increase risk of bacterial infections, fungal infections, flare up of tuberculosis. So you have a situation where early on in the disease, you want to reduce inflammation, but not do it through steroids. And then what we typically do in our protocol is do a day seven blood test and then use steroids in the second week if needed, along with anticoagulants if needed. So out of the six medicines in our protocol, CAF, IBB, colchicine, aspirin, famotidine, ivermectin, bromhexine, and budesonide, 
Four of them are anti-inflammatories, working on these mechanisms. Colchicine on the NLRP, aspirin, COX, famotidine, histamine type 2, pyrocinide is a glucocorticoid. The other two, ivermectin and bromhexin, are antiviral. So I'll try to really run through this quickly because it's, um, most non-medical people will find this incredibly boring. But the colchicine works on the NLRP inflammasome pathway and so does mephanamic acid uh, called meftal in India. Anyone interested in how the NLRP pathway stimulates IL-6 and CRP are more than welcome to read that. Another pathway that we're trying to inhibit is the cyclooxygenase pathway uh, in which the aerodonic acid pathway leads to production of thromboxane A2 and other prosinoids. Um, Anti-inflammatories and aspirin inhibit the COX pathway. There is also a very interesting paper on how blockage of the histamine type 2 pathway could be beneficial for COVID-19 inflammation and um, people are most welcome to read that article uh, from Frontiers in Science. And it's very well known how steroids also reduce inflammation. Now, one thing I'd like to say, of course, the concern around immune suppression and flare up of other disease is more with oral steroids and IV steroids, but we're more than happy to use inhaled steroids early in the disease, as we do with bitocinide. And there are some, um, some other pathways I'd like to mention here, which are used in hospital for resistant inflammation, where even steroids cannot bring inflammation down. One is the interleukin-6 pathway, uh, which is targeted by tocizolumab, actemra, and sterilumab, kevzara. And the other is the JAK-STAT2 pathway, which is targeted by baricitinib olumiant. And we have, um, I've done blogs in the past on how we can reduce inflammation of the IL-6 as well as inflammation of JAK-STAT using diet. So if I quickly just run through those, and um, I'm sure that Seema, our holistic nutritionist with us, will be going through those as well. So we talk about IL-6 inhibitors, but we talk about how we can reduce inflammation in our body otherwise by maintaining ideal weight, being active, exercising, sleeping well, underlying any, um, any underlying sleep apnea, which is typically obese patients who snore and have a double chin is important. Minimizing pro-inflammatory foods, that is generally foods which have a long storage life uh, they often contain processed sugars such as high fructose corn starch or corn syrup. Um, also avoiding saturated trans fats, which is um, usually in deep fried foods, processed sausages, hot dogs, nuggets, those kinds of things. Also when you have fiber, choose natural fiber over refined foods in which the fiber has been stripped out. So choose natural fruit over fruit jam or marmalade. Choose brown bread over white bread and so on. Also maximizing fresh fruits, vegetables, fish which contain omega-3. Of course, that shouldn't be fried. Uh, typically, this would be salmon, mackerel, tuna, um, trout, rainbow trout. Also using oils which have high amount of monounsaturated fat such as grapeseed oil or avocado oil, using spreads which contain avocado-based spreads, or perhaps they may be fortified with plant stanols or plant sterols, using nuts such as walnuts, and using specific anti-inflammatory foods and herbs and spices. And here there's a list of the spices and herbs which inhibit IL-6, which includes curcumin haldi, quercetin is found, is a red pigment found in apples and red onions, berries, thymoquinone is kalonji, alum, alum sativum is in garlic, and ginger also inhibits IL-6, so that's lassan and adrak. Cardamom or elaichi also inhibits STAT pathway, so does fenugreek, methi. Long 
oregano oil, ajwain also is anti-inflammatory. Um, cruciferous vegetables like cauliflower, broccoli, cabbages inhibit STAT3 pathway. Akrot, green tea, hing, jeera. All these things are anti-inflammatory. And similarly, in the talk about jack stat pathway, in which we talk about baricitinib, a very similar kind of picture. Um, here, apart from the ones we mentioned before, we also have peanuts, berries, grapes, lemons, fruits like oranges, tomatoes, beans, um, carrots, lettuce, green peas, wine as well which i remember last talk uh, ashish was very happy about black coffee uh, other kinds of fruits like uh, cranberries rosemary lavender peppermint thyme hawthorn see guavas chili peppers pumpkin seeds flax seeds broccoli all of these as i mentioned before green tea and black coffee all of these things will naturally reduce inflammation. So with regards to what you, there is a list of food that you try to avoid, which are inflammatory, as we discussed before, primarily processed, refined carbohydrates and mono uh, saturated trans fats. And, and then there is a list of foods that you take, which are anti-inflammatory as we discussed before. So with this, um, let me hand over to Seema for her presentation. Seema, over to you. Yeah, hello Thank everybody. You. Let me just uh, present my screen. Yeah, so based on today's topic, uh, we will be discussing about uh, some of the uh, can help to reduce inflammation as well as to support our immune system uh, during the COVID times. Diagram the things that we can do from our side uh, when we want to prevent or when we don't want uh, Seema, uh, to be get into a situation where uh, we get, uh, we Seema, can you hear me? We are in the state that. Seema, can you hear me? Um, do you want yes, to yes. Do you want to do full screen, which is that uh, button next to the minus, just on the left of the minus? You can press the full screen. This you mean this? No, 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 no. Uh, right next to it on the left. Not side. the uh, presentation. Yeah, that one. Yeah, right next to it, on the left side of minus is a full screen button. You can see uh, plus and minus. Full screen. Something. You can see the minus just on the left of the minus. That that button. See my can you see the plus and minus? Yeah. Uh, I don't see that. Uh, so can, you see, can, you, can you see One the book? Second. Can you see the book sign? A book sign and a minus sign. The button between the book sign and the minus sign. Bottom right side of the screen. Layout exit full. It's in the full screen mode only. One second. Exit full screen. Okay, you can you can carry on then, Seema. Just maybe zoom a, a zoom a bit, perhaps. Okay. Uh, can you see the diagram? Yes, yes. It's not full screen, but we can see it. Yeah, go, carry on. Uh, yeah. So, so as seen in the diagram, there are certain things that we, we can do from our side, like using foods and herbs and diet or supplements to prevent the infection and, and to strengthen our immunity. The other things that you can do is use an antiviral agent on mask. Then you can use a add disinfectant essential oils to help stop the aerosol transmission uh, 
and we can also use a surface sanitizing agent to provide disinfectant environment so these are all the things that we can do at home and one more thing i would like to add to this is what happens is most of the things what we are seeing now is uh, i i feel that stress also plays a major uh, part in this and when stress becomes chronic and mismanaged it is it 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 is detriment uh, to our health and well being so let's uh, some of the examples uh, uh, of unhealthy stress include inadequate recovery from physical mental and emotional strength of any 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 kind uh, this could be related to exercise constant worrying and repetitive thoughts of negative nature and even emotions such as depression and anxiety prolonged stress leads to uh, hyper uh, psychological uh, levels of uh, cortisol so this alters the effectiveness of cortisol to regulate both the inflammatory and the immune response and because is the tissue sensitive sensitivity to cortisol so as a human body heals inflammation becomes a response to stress stress inflammation is beneficial although when stress becomes chronic it can lead to constant down and see uh, as you all know what inflammation is what are the inflammatory markers signs and symptoms chronic disease risk and inflammation the acidity alkalinity prebiotics and the probiotics including essential fatty acids using food as medicine like for that we have to go to the nutritional basics then shifts colorful superfoods that we can incorporate it in our living an anti inflammatory diet that is which is more like fiber rich and processed uh, free reducing the overall inflammation and supporting our immune health now what a, what is inflammation and what are the inflammatory markers so what uh, what we always see right it is believed that whenever somebody takes a vaccine so you want that vaccine to work and why is that for some people the vaccine works and for some people it doesn't work so there are some things like your body has to take care like to uh, pro produce antibodies uh, and virus specific t cell response so you want that response when the body is in stress and what happens is because uh because of the stress it can negatively impact the antibodies and the t response cell so then some people have seen that taking a vaccination also like after taking two shots also they are getting they are getting into that state right so the body is not the body so inflammation plays a big role in this so what exactly is inflammation and inflammation happens when the immune system fights against something that may turn out to be harmful and there are two types of uh, inflammation acute and chronic acute inflammation is that you need that acute inflammation because it's it helps us to repair our body but the chronic inflammation is the problem uh, what happens with chronic inflammation uh, because the thing is it occurs over a longer period of time and it lasts for months to years and this results from the ongoing social mental stress or frequent consumption of fast food processed food and then the failure to eliminate that source of stress can create environment that allows chronic inflammation to flourish so uh, the inflammatory markers that is always uh, to find out the to conduct a blood test uh, to find out the c reactive protein that is the high sensitivity c reactive protein uh, protein which is a marker of inflammation so doctors also do a homocysteine level to uh, to evaluate the chronic inflammation and finally physicians also touch uh, test the H hba1c a measurement of blood sugar to as to assess the damage of the red blood cells so what does chronic inflammation do to our body like early symptoms of chronic inflammation may be vague with subtle um, signs and symptoms that may go undetected for a long period you may just feel slightly fatigue or even normal as inflammation progresses however you can see the damage in the arteries organs and joint and then when it is left unchecked what happens is it contributes to chronic diseases such as heart disease blood vessels diabetes obesity cancer alzheimers and other conditions now this is again the diet and the lifestyle factors are the biggest contributors uh, for the 
chronic inflammation a diet which is filled with meat dairy processed and fast foods tends to be more inflammatory and foods that are high in high fat high sugar and high in salt also contribute to this chronic inflammation so uh, so what can we do like improving our food choices decreasing the inflammatory markers just as reducing lifestyle stressor does ultimately the best way to com combat uh, chronic inflammation is a combination of changing your dietary behaviors and reducing the lifestyle stressors so chronic inflammation signs and symptoms as you may all be knowing non uh, moving waste weight high blood glucose levels digestive problems gas diarrhea bloating constipation frequently tired such as eczema psoriasis or red or blotchy skin puffy skin or bags under your eyes brain fog water retention food cravings joint pain stiffness acne and uh, research has also uh, shown that the chronic inflammation and autoimmune disease plays a role uh, how chronic inflammation creates a stress in your body and that is what is weakening your immune system also find uh, uh, that fruits and vegetables and herbs for their health benefits so these are some some of the herbs uh, some of the herbs that we uh during the herbs and spices that can be used uh uh to uh, for this uh, virus uh for example cinnamon cinnamon as the studies have been found for sars covid human respiratory synecdical virus avian influenza virus turmeric black pepper clove ginger garlic basil giloy and neem so incorporating this as a part of your daily lifestyle would really help and then there are few food applications what i researched about like sea vegetables also helps to reduce the inflammatory markers that is circulating in the body which helps to reduce the chronic inflammation research has also confirmed that antioxidant capacity of six species of alaskan seaweed making it high, highly anti inflammatory so seaweeds are rich in macro minerals and alkaline rich food so increasing alkalinity in the body also reduce inflammatory markers so once your body is more acidic it, it always has this inflammation when your body is alkaline it's what you have to do you have to make your body more alkaline so one second then the food applications about black beans study sh shown that black beans for their ability to reduce the inflammatory markers linked with cancer cells the phytochemical compounds in black beans were shown to have ability to re reduce the inflammatory markers and they are highly rich in fiber and protein uh, which provide overall energy and uh, aid in digestion uh, then cranberries fresh prepara preparation of cranberries helps to preserve the polyphenols found in cranberry it's a phytoactive uh, compound in cranberries uh that helps to get um, rid of the bacteria which causes inflammatory response especially dietary consumption of cranberries leads to reduction of chronic inflammatory markers uh anti inflammatory foods and dietary patterns foods and dietary patterns are effective in reducing the underlying inflammatory process associated with chronic disease so a diet which is high in fruits and vegetables may be one of the best defense against chronic inflammation and fruits and vegetables are highly bioavailable source of vitamins minerals fiber and polyphenols with anti inflammatory activity and a cross um, sectional study investigating self reported fruits and vegetable intake among adults found that individuals reporting the highest consumption more than two servings of fruits and three servings of vegetables daily have significantly lower plasma levels of pro inflammatory that is the crp il6 the tnf alpha as well as decreased biomarkers of oxidative stress uh four to five servings daily of each fruits and vegetables are recommended to combat inflammation and chronic now uh 10 ways uh how we a uh, food can reduce inflammation 
we are seeing is the people uh, with uh, existing pre-existing condition like many people with diabetes high high cholesterol hypertension and other chronic problems have high levels of inflammation in their bodies that occur over the time when the immune system tries unsuccessfully to repair cells and rid itself of harmful toxins the right foods can help reduce the amount of inflammation in the body and improve health so there are 10 suggestions for the clients and patients for uh, for eating to decrease their inflammation so first will be boosting your consumptions of fruits and veg vegetables aim to eat four to five servings table daily choose fru fruits and vegetables that are deep green orange yellow and purple since these have the greatest nu nutritional value so 10 servings per day may sound too much but serving sizes are small so one medium fruit half a cup of canned or frozen fruit half a cup of cooked vegetable half a cup of fruit juice and a half a cup or uh, one a cup one leafy greens cook with olive oil as much as possible as you know it may uh, can be used for salad dressings make a quick and easy dressing by combining olive oil or balsamic vinegar minced garlic fresh chopped parsley chives using dried herbs and fresh aren't available um, uh virgin olive oil is best when uh, since it is more inflammation inflammation fighting antioxidants than refined um olive oil uh, snack on walnuts instead of chips uh, so walnuts also provide provide fiber minerals antioxidants and the kind of fatty acids that are good for your heart grain cereals such as oat oatmeal for breakfast you can and replace it with refined grains with whole grains such as substituting brown rice for white rice eating fatty fish such as salmon two to three times a week uh, to get more omega 3 fatty acids while salmon has more omega 3s than farmed salmon eating fewer fast food many tend to be cooked in oils that contains trans fatty acids which increase inflammation so if you eat at fast food restaurants order a grilled chicken sandwich or salad with vinaigrette dressing potatoes with sweet potatoes like they are high in vitamins and delicious when baked with little olive oil garlic and rosemary cut down on sugary drinks such as juice soda and punch add small amounts of cider fruit juice or wedges of lemon or orange to plain water to enhance the flavor uh, eat more lentils and beans these are good sources of proteins and can be replaced by red meat at meals black beans and brown rice sorted with onions and garlic and seasoned with cumin chocolates and fresh raspberries for desserts both are lo loaded with antioxidants so let's see how we can naturally approach inflammation the foods that we eat can lead to either prevent inflammation which is one of the final pathways for most of the common diseases it is a crucial protective reaction it is that to protect us soon can take place what you eat can return to be inflammation on but more importantly what you eat can turn inflammation off so the eight major food substances that contribute to inflammation cause of inflammation is sugar which exists in the form of corn syrup dextrose fructose golden syrup maltose sucrose if you have any signs of inflammation or any problems linked to inflammation such as heart disease memory loss autoimmune it is eliminate sugar there are good oils that are very good in omega 6 and omega 3 ratio such as olive oil avocado oil and macadamia nut oil the bad oils are very high in omega 6 fatty acids and should be avoided these are the cotton seed oil corn oil sunflower vegetable oil this bad oil such as industrial vegetable in fast foods and processed food so trans fats are the worst fats and are uh found in deep fried foods fast foods and commercially prepared baked goods cow's milk can also lead to inflammation as is a common contributor to arthritis skin rashes chronic sin uh, sinus conditions and irritable bowel problems lactose intolerance also causes inflammation and leads to stomach distress diarrhea gas and bloating cured meats and red meats contain a substance called as new 5 gc which is a compound that the body sees as a foreign invader so it produces antibodies and triggers an inflammatory response 
consume, consumption is also linked to irritation and inflammation of the esophagus. Esophagus and throat cancers are linked to uh, alcohol consumption as well as liver and alcohol re, uh, induced hepatitis. Another cause of inflammation for many people is the consumption of refined flours such as white bread and white rice and also turn quickly into sugar in our bodies. Grains plus added sugars and bad fats such as donuts is a triple whammy. Artificial food additives such as MSG, monosodium glutamate and all artificial sweetness like Splenda, NutraSweet, Saturine trigger the inflammatory response. Do not eat anything in a package unless you read the label and identify all the ingredients. Raw honey, monk food, stevia are better choices for natural sweetness. So inflammation is our body's natural response to injury, infection, stress, foreign substances, and anything that irritates the human body. And cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and heart disease are all linked to this inflammation. Uh, the chemical uh, irritants, secondhand smoke pesticides are all seen by the body as foreign invaders so turn on the immune system this, this irritation can also lead to chronic inflammation of the lung and increase the risk of cancer allergy of a food cause an inflammatory response these types of response can present a chronic sinus issue again bedwetting asthma joint pain diarrhea gas and bloating skin rashes uh, fatigue and other issues a food elimination diet or a good uh, or a blood test for food sensitivities and food allergies can be helpful to guiding you to lessen the inflammation. Another common is midline weight, also known as excess belly fat. The fat cells are actually an inflammatory organ that can produce cytokines, which raise the blood pressure, cause inflammation and ca can lead to diabetes. If you have a chronic sleep disturbance or have few hours of lost sleep, or sleep apnea, the body turns on the different system which leads to inflammation. So any other ways to prevent inflammation? So start today to improve your overall health. Eating whole foods, fish high in omega-3, seaweed, and whole fruits and vegetables. Use healthy oils on, on your food. Drink filtered water, but do not drink water from plastic bottles unless they are BPA-free. Get plenty of exercise and good sleep. Other foods and Herbs that protect you from inflammations are turmeric, broccoli, shiitake mushrooms, green tea, holy basil, or tulsi tea, ginger, and basil. At last but not least, toxic stress that's emotional, mental, and spiritual stress can aggravate already inflamed body. Take time to be, breathe, relax, and connect with your loved ones. So, these are some of the spices uh, which helps to reduce the inflammation. Curcumin, uh, that's the main active ingredient in turmeric and it has a powerful anti and is very um, strong antioxidant uh, curcumin is purely absorbed into bloodstreams so it helps to consume black pepper with it which increases the pepperin in the natural substance and that enhances the absor absorption of curcumin by 2000 percent the key takeaway is that curcumin is a bioactive substance that fights infl inflammation at a molecular level then the other one is cinnamon. Cinnam cinnamon uh, aldehyde is the incredible compound that gives cinnamon its order and flavor. And it can also ease swelling and prevent blood platelets from clumping together. So its anti-inflammatory qualities don't stop here. It can also block certain substances associated with abnormal cell growth and thereby lowering the risk of disease. Better blood sugar control. Chronically high blood sugar can also lead to inflammation in your body. Then rosemary. Rosemary is also a rich source of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds, which are boost the immune system and improve your blood circulation. Everybody. Thank you so much. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an Thank excellent you. talk. That was an excellent talk. Thank you, Seema. There were lots of things I learned. Now, Sadhna, you're typing stuff. Just uh, say it, Sadhna. Now we're opening the talk to general discussion. Um, so I would like to uh, 
thank everyone who has had the patience for sitting up with us for like one and a half hours almost. It's been a long session. So uh, I'd like to open the uh, floor for anyone who wants to pitch in, tell us about your experiences, and what you think. If you have any questions for Seema, if you have any questions for me, I certainly learned a lot of new things. Um, let me just offer the uh, uh, my parents first then. Daddy, mommy, do you have any questions? Any thoughts? No questions, please. Thank you so much for everything you are doing. Thank you. I think Kamal Thank you, Zaman. Thank you. Anyway, we'll, uh, we are uh, uh, we are in the high risk group, and uh, though we don't have any problem of. Uh, these things uh, like COVID or uh, inflammation or whatever, still uh, we do take uh, the uh, primary uh, these uh, vitamins and uh, minerals uh, as uh, suggested and prescribed by you on, from time to time. And uh, on a regular basis, we also take uh, exercises, physical exercises. Mainly the uh, one and a half uh, hours uh, yoga, 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 and pranayam. So we are keeping fit and uh, yeah. away from the crowd. We are in our village. From there, uh, we are connected uh, by these uh, data. We don't have uh, uh, the Wi-Fi here. So so far so good. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless. Thank you. Kamalati, I believe you had a question. You were raising your hand. You'll have to unmute. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't raise my hand. It was very informative. Thank you. 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 Um, I had a question, Seema. You talked about alkaline diet. So, can you give some examples of foods which are alkaline in nature? I've heard, you know, say apple cider vinegar we should take one spoon a day, or I mean, I do take, I used to take at one time. You are on mute, uh, Seema. So, you can give some examples. Yeah. Uh, to, increase, to increase your alkalinity in the body, uh, morning you can start taking uh, lemon water source of alkaline then eating raw ginger if you are able to eat a raw ginger that is one of the best things and then incorporating all the green leafy like cucumber uh, green leaf you have to always make sure the thing like for example when you are adding milk to a tea it becomes acidic so you want to you don't have to be too much acidic your body you, you have to be more alkaline so always incorporate incorporating salads veggies right that helps your body to become more alkaline then um, uh, uh, baking salads while making salad make sure that you put a lot of lemons in the salad when you're marinating something right for making fish or chicken or anything you can put lemon apple cider vinegar eating uh, papaya papaya is one good source you can cook with raw papaya so there are many things that you can incorporate yeah so you have to make sure that your diet has a has a uh, combination of everything yes. yeah thank you thank you for that and then just uh, you know you've suggested like fruits vegetables you know natural so in addition to taking those if somebody is still having inflammation i mean is there <laughs> some over-the-counter medication or some natural thing like you said you suggested green tea or something that may be a good like to take on tea. a regular basis yeah you can take green tea you can take peppermint tea you can take herbal teas right uh, that is caffeine free herbal teas inflammation and the most important thing is you have to be hydrated. That is also important. So uh, the thing is, the inflammation in your body increases when you are more acidic. 
you have to make sure you have to balance it out things that you can do like using trying out various different veggies and all right there are few vegetables we haven't tried but just google search it every week that is what i keep doing every week i will try something new new dish or new vegetables yeah because the thing is with canada is we get vegetables from everywhere right so i keep trying many different things and also yeah, yeah. like incorporating for example uh, we have the kefir and yogurt and all right so basically that is good to incorporate in your diet so i always make uh, sure that every every day i will add a little bit to make something like for example chutneys and all i use kefir to make chutneys i i put ginger so whatever is there like one by one i do everything so whenever i make chutney i make sure that i have the uh, tomatoes i have the garlic i have all this uh, like the thing is i don't have to eat it separately so i just take it right so like for example quercetin is a good thing uh, you know that it has it's an antioxidant it helps with everything so you know the sources what are the sources try to find out then yeah apple is a good source you can make something with apples make something with onion so Uh, making something so every every meal i i keep planning things like that yeah um i i ji i will i will uh, hazard um a response as well sadha is going to ask something next also can sure, i request, sure. can i request everyone just be very slick with your mute button when you talking unmute when, uh, when you stop talking mute because we have about 15 people watching us facebook and youtube we want to maintain good sound quality so they can hear what we are saying let me quickly just uh let me quickly just share my screen because you were asking about supplements which also reduce inflammation so even on my covid-19 uh management protocol dated september here it is So this is the protocol. You know, first week assessment, day seven blood test, second week assessment, management, treatment. But there is a section at the very end which is uh, the kind of supplements which may reduce inflammation in patients who have pre-existing chronic inflammation. And you'll see the ones that I've mentioned here uh, include. Here we are. Should be coming very soon. Of course, that's all the dietary aspects. Here we are. So, uh, black cumin seed oil is Nigella sativa. It's uh, the active constituent is thymoquinone, very powerful anti-inflammatory. For patients who have sleeping dis disturbance, they can try every so often melatonin with magnesium. These also have antioxidant properties. Anyone who has pre-existing heart conditions or is using a statin may want to consider coenzyme Q10. with omega 3 uh, powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory and finally um, anyone who has you know chronic inflammation perhaps fatty liver they could also consider curcumin supplements of course uh, diet is only and supplements are only one part of reducing inflammation the other part is also you know keeping an ideal weight staying active reducing stress reducing external pollutants like seema discussed in her talk also um, you know maintaining uh, low belly fat there's so many other factors which will also reduce inflammation but yes diet and supplements certainly have a role in that thank you very much sadna i believe you have a question Yeah, Sapan. I just want to add for people in India. Right now, it's going. The temperatures are really high, like almost forty degrees. It's touching. If you can get hold of coconut water, because it's freely available there and it's very rich in vitamins and minerals, that will really help you. Uh, coming from my personal experience, uh, tomato soup really helped me. If you can incorporate that in your diet with cu uh, cumin. um uh, powdered cumin black pepper and turmeric with and little bit of ginger and garlic soup uh, in the soup that will really help people patients who are suffering from covid if you are a meat eater then kharoda soup india in india you get a uh, bones it's very easy in your dinner 
time you can add that because soups do help with inflammation as well as your throat irritation um my cough really it helped me when i had a lot of chicken soup uh, so just uh, um adding more uh, rather than drinking milk because a lot of indian people including my dad has a habit of drinking two glass of milk in a day instead of that during your covid time if you can reduce that because it will increase your cough as well as inflammation have lassi it will it will help you with your stomach as well as uh, digestion of um, few things and lastly olive oil is not readily available in india and it's very expensive so some people do use mustard oil which has very anti fungal properties so you can substitute little so some of your meals with making foods in mustard oil rather than um corn oil or vegetable oil that's all i wanted to add sapan yeah Thank so alas alas seema to comment on that cuz uh, certain things certainly increasing protein in the diet may be beneficial for for patients with covid because they can lose their appetite they may lose their muscle mass they need to build antibodies which are proteins and so increasing protein i can certainly understand with regards to coconut water and the tomato soup and the other things seema wonder if you could add uh, to that part uh yeah especially uh see the uh, vitamin c vitamin sources of vitamin c can be tomatoes and other things right so vitamin c vitamin d zinc the sources of uh, zinc so make sure that during during this covid time right so this really helps with the virus getting into your system right if your if your immune system is strong it won't get into you so you have to make sure that you do it consistently you keep doing things that's it right it's not a short fix for anything it's a, it's it should be a long term thing for everybody and i would also like to uh, like i was researching on few things that so i would like two weeks before and two weeks after taking a vaccine what should be your protocol at home for example like always two weeks before make sure that you have a high fiber diet and fermented foods and to start two weeks before the vaccine and continue for minimum two weeks after so fiber rich diets encourage the growth of beneficial bacteria that supports the immune response chopped onion garlic grated ginger juice from half a lemon carrot to a quart of miso chicken or mushroom broth simmer for 15 minutes and add parsley and lemon juice at the end so it's always better to buy some chicken broth or make it on your own at home uh, always consider eating a low glycemic for few days before and after the vaccine so the thing is uh, it's always better healing will be soon comparatively soon and then you you always hydrate yourself because your body should not be dehydrated the tips that i was just uh, researching about very nice um mummy do you want to just mention your uh, the kadha that you make at home and what kind of anti inflammatory herbs that contains thank you so much as yes, i am making every day kada by uh, mixing one glass of hot water i mix uh, giloy amlethi uh, trifla trifla and cabbages uh, good ginger fresh ginger fresh um, uh, turmeric juice herbs they might want to put in uh, to maximize the anti inflammatory benefit i think seema is busy with something else anyone else want to um, take that one about kada 
I I make kadha means every morning in my tea. Sima was on mute. Sima has to unmute. So I put in my tea. I put the uh, tulsi leaves, dried tulsi leaves. When I had fresh tulsi, I used to do fresh tulsi, ginger, cloves, cinnamon. Uh, that's pretty much you know. And then uh, just boil like. i take extra water let it boil for a little bit like 5 minutes i will let it boil and then i will put my tea and everything and drink that every day so that has been protecting me at least you know doing very good for me thanks <laughs> thank you asha thank you so so one of one of the kada would be like this uh, powder 1 teaspoon of turmeric powder then two cloves lemon with skin the whole skin and ginger the skin remove one and a half piece of ginger then you put it in the water one liter water and boil it for uh, till it becomes half liter you boil it make it regular regularly so this really helps and this tip is from somebody who got covid and got cured in 24 hours thank you for sharing those with us so um yeah we've been going on for almost 2 hours now so i think we should perhaps close this and and we can meet again next week so um thank you seema thank you so much for your contributions thank you to daddy mummy asha ji sadhna kamla ji jyoti ashish thank you to everyone thank you thank you everyone thank, thank you thank you thank you bye everyone